you're going to put on my right. Okay. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hello. So the mic is working, I see. All right. First of all, Stephen, thank you so much for coming down to spend the day with us. Thank you for inviting me. I know you're extremely busy, and there's a lot going on in the CFDA right now. We were just talking backstage about last week the CFDA held its annual award ceremony, which is widely known as the Oscars of the fashion world. Gets a lot of attention. You might have seen pictures of Kim and Kanye mm -hmm. arriving at the award ceremony, or any one of the 470 members of the CFDA there with one of their celebrity guests. It's a very shiny event. And then next month, the CFDA is hosting its first Men's Fashion Week. So that happens, what, over three days? Uh, three days, yeah. Three July. days in mid-July. Yeah. It's going to feature 43 American menswear designers. And then two months after that, you go right back into the second edition of the 2015 um, New York Fashion Week fashion shows, which are predominantly women's wear. That's right. So you got a lot going on. Yeah, it's all good, though. <laughs> But you know, all those are really glamorous things, and um, and that's good because part of the CFDA's mission is to bring attention to American fashion design, and those, that certainly gets a lot of press. But I know that your mission is a lot broader than that. Can you talk for a little while about what the CFDA's mission is, and also what its membership looks like? Sure. The, the CFDA is a 52-year-old organization, Council of Fashion Designers of America. It was started. Um, by a publicist by the name of Eleanor Lambert. And probably if you look back to when CFDA was started, it's not that much different than what's happening in Nashville now with the NFA here. And what she realized was that the American designer uh, wasn't being recognized. He or she was working in the back room uh, for manufacturers and didn't get the credit or the acknowledgement for their contribution. So she began to promote them and they really became the face uh, of the industry more so than the manufacturers. And very early on, designers like Jeffrey Bean and, and, and uh, Bill Blass uh, were uh, part of that movement. And so over the uh, course of that time, since she founded CFDA, which was an arts organization, it's grown to be a very um, influential trade organization. Uh, and that's primarily what our work is. We also have a foundation where we do charitable giving around issues that are important to our industry, but we really focus on promoting American fashion, American fashion designers in the industry in a global environment. Uh, our uh, organization is a membership organization, so it uh, has now about 500 members of the CFDA, and I won't steal your CFDA anecdote. You <laughs> Which is such a good one. You so want to use it now? I'm going to use it later. Okay. It's, it's uh, in my script. Uh, we are 500 <laughs> members of the CFDA, and, uh, and this ranges from uh, the very famous Ralph Donick, Calvin, Michael Kors, to the new generation, younger talent, people like uh, Problem Burying, Public School, uh, Proenza Schooler, but in between that is a, uh, a small business owner, and that's really the backbone of the organization. These are organizations, businesses that are, you know, anywhere from a million to 15 million dollars, and they're very uh, solid and, and comfortable in, in that space. And so what we do is we program and we create opportunities for designers on uh, the life cycle uh, of their career, starting with students uh, working with design schools, then doing uh, programs for emerging designers, a lot of work for the experienced designer, and then, of course, engaging the famous and the more established designers as well. Right. So what kind of professional development specifically do you give your general membership? Yeah, well, the, the, the industry changes very quickly. So on, on a regular basis, let me back up a little bit. A lot of designers come into the industry uh, from a creative place. The, they're not really trained as business people. They've got good ideas uh, and, and vision, but they don't really know how to translate those ideas into uh, a, a real business. So we'll, we'll do a lot of programming in professional development around things like 
financial planning, strategic planning, HR, uh, doing business in Asia, uh, marketing, PR, social media, and these topics will change depending upon what kind of is happening uh, at the moment. Currently, a lot of what our work has been has been around social responsibility and sustainability uh, because that is something that the industry's been paying a lot of attention to. Right. Okay, so the CFDA Vogue Fashion Fund and the CFDA Fashion Incubator programs are two business initiatives that support designers, probably at different points in their careers. How does the CFDA use each of these to help designers grow their businesses? So I'll mention the CFDA Vogue Fashion Fund uh, is probably the, the better known one. Uh, it's actually been a TV show on Ovation, but nobody gets Ovation on their cable <laughs> channel, so nobody knows about it, uh, called the Fashion Fund. And, uh, and it, it, it's a docu-series which actually uh, shows the process. But what that program is, is uh, uh, designers apply uh, and we select 10 that we think are the most promising. And over the course of six months, we evaluate them through uh, a number of ways, uh, by visiting them in their studios, looking at their business plans, uh, coming to their fashion shows, asking them to do some special projects. And at the end of that, we'll pick three of them uh, who win business grants and mentors. Actually, Billy Reed and Natalie Channon have both come out of that program. Billy actually won it uh, a few years ago, and they get a mentor. So in the instance of Billy, his mentor was Jenna Lyons, who's the president and creative director of J. Crow. Derek Lamb, who won it, he had the mentor uh, named Dominica De Sole. So they're really getting very seasoned top talent from the business side who are advising them uh, on their businesses. And because it's part of, uh, because Vogue is our partner on that, it comes with a very high cachet, a very high um, um, level of acknowledgement, both in the magazine and with the editor of Vogue, Anna Wintour, who's very, very hands-on on that program. So basically, in the years that that program exists, we've had about 120 designers who've come through it. And not when our 10th anniversary, the New York Times did a, a story on it and looked at how many of them were still in business. And went and so 10 years, 100 designers, 10 a year, 95 of them were still in business. And that percentage is somewhat unprecedented because if you look at startups like in the restaurant business, how, how quickly many of them can go out of business. And that's because when they get in the program, there's no option to fail. They have to succeed. And if we see that there is something that's a challenge, we step in and help them. The incubator is different. The incubator is actually a physical space where, which is in partnership with the mayor's office in New York City. The designer moves into the, the space, 10 as well. It's subsidized by a landlord partner and the CFDA. And during that two years, uh, the designers are giving mentors, people who rotate throughout the two-year course that they're in there. Uh, again, things like merchandising, production, sales, uh, retail, uh, specific to what that designer needs help with. And we call it an incubator, uh, but it's more an accelerator. Incubator is a little bit younger. These are designers that have been in business already. And, and there's a lot of opportunity that's connected to their involvement in the incubator. We pair them with MBA students who are interested in fashion and luxury. So they're working with them on the business side uh, and helping them kind of uh, get the most out of the two years that they're in that program. It's terrific. Um, so I know that partnerships and collaborations are a big part of the organization too. Can you talk about your strategic partnership group? Yeah, so, you know, fashion is, everybody wants fashion now. Uh, fashion has become such a part of pop culture. It sits alongside, I think, music and, and film and television. And I think that the um, access that we have to content and information makes everybody more aware. And I think fashion it has benefited from that. I mean, it's also, uh, I, I think, maybe had a little bit of, of a negative as well. You look at shows like Project Runway, which uh, uh, 
uh, created great awareness about that fashion, but maybe didn't doesn't really tell the full depth of what it means to be in the business and, and, and the commitment and, and what you need to uh, be successful. So with the strategic partnership group, we're looking at two kinds of partners. We're looking at corporate partners that want to touch fashion and come to us because they see us as the authority on fashion. And a good example would be Procter & Gamble. Um, uh, if, you sh if you do laundry and you use Tide, and specifically Todd Pides, uh, Procter & Gamble is very interested in developing a customer base that is less about dry cleaning and, and more about washable fashion. So we can engage with our membership and get a sense from them on fabric development and uh, product and, and create a dialogue between the corporate partner and the industry on what that shift would be and how do we, how do we get more people to, to wash clothes and, and less dry cleaning. And so that's a very good example uh, of, of, a, of a corporate partner. We have Starbucks as a partner. Um, um, uh, everyone in fashion drinks a lot of coffee and a lot of Starbucks. And so with Starbucks, they want to bring creativity and talent into it. So they'll come to us and we'll connect them to a designer who will do special product with them. So uh, Rodarte did ceramic tumblers and gift cards. And so for the designer, what's the value of being in, in Starbucks? It's a little bit of money, but not enough to really do it. But think of Starbucks' as reach both in stores, online, and in their marketing. They're expanding their visibility to a, a, a very, very, very broad audience. Most of our partners, though, are B2B partners. They're people that will come to us that have new ideas, new technologies, new programs, new services, new product that will actually help a designer's business and their bottom line. So that could be something like um, a app that is a fabric sourcing opportunity for a designer that streamlines it and makes it more convenient. Uh, and so these are the kind of uh, partnerships that are part of the strategic partnership. Group. Right. I was reading that Cadillac just signed on as a sponsor of um, Men's Week. Yeah. So with, with Men's Fashion Week, which is July 14th, 15th, and 16th in, in, in New York, uh, we, are, we have a number of partners, uh, Amazon Fashion, and they're very interested in developing a a higher level of product uh, within their platform. And so they're our main overall partner. But we also have DreamWorks, uh, Shinola, which is made in USA, Detroit, uh, and Cadillac has recently joined us. So they come on board because they know that the people who will be attending uh, New York Men's Fashion Week are, are consumers that have money, and they want to connect to that and have that association. Absolutely. So I want to stop for a minute and talk for just a quick second about the Nashville Fashion Alliance. The NFA is a recently formed local fashion trade organization that supports area designers through advocacy, economic development, education, and shared resources. And allow me to be so bold as to say that we are the CFEA of Nashville, <laughs> or we aspire to eventually have the influence. You you can do that. Okay, good. We're going to use that yeah. then. Steven said we could use it, guys, so we're good. Um, but the NFA is working hard to put in some localized manufacturing efforts, and we're looking for ways to work with the local government in this. So I know you guys have had a lot of success working with the Economic Development um, Council in New York City, and you've now got two administrations you've been working with, right? Bloomberg and de Blasio. Uh -huh. So how did, you, how did that relationship start, and how, is, how do you continue to grow it? Yeah, I think the, the issue of manufacturing is an important one, not just in fashion, but uh, in general for this country. And it's a complex one uh, as well. Uh, fashion is the second biggest business in New York after finance, so the local administration there sees the value of supporting uh, and helping um, the industry be more successful. And manufacturing is one of the four pillars uh, of our focus right now. And, had, and our work there really comes from the uh, industry itself. There's a brand called Theory. A guy named Andrew Rosen uh, uh, is the president and CEO of Theory. 
and he's third, second generation garment industry person, and he saw this um, kind of deterioration uh, of local production in New York. Most of it, uh, in, in, if you know New York, there's an area in Midtown called the Garment District, and that's where most of the production happened uh, in its height in the 50s. Lots of that has gone offshore. And Andrew knows, and, and, and he, he remembers that when he started, he had direct access to local factories. And he, know, and he says that if it wasn't for that direct as, access, he would have never been able to start his business uh, and, and have the success that he had. Now, we don't have any um, um, uh, fantasy that big production's going to come back to New York City, but we see New York City and its garment district in other regions of New York being really a research and development hub because young designers don't have the capacity uh, to produce offshore or the capacity to do volume. And I think the most important thing about local production is the uh, proximity, the dialogue between uh, creativity and production. The closer it is, the better the end result. There's something that can get lost in the conversation when someone who's creating something in New York, yet it's being made in China, you know, there, you know, you, there's bound to be error there. But if you're just one or two blocks away, you can be very intimate and you can be there uh, uh, on top of what you're doing. So what we did with um, the mayor's office is through uh, a grant from, from the city uh, of a million dollars. Uh, we were able to raise money from very uh, top industry people like Coach Ralph Lauren, Andrew himself, uh, and put together a fund uh, which now is available to any production facility in the five boroughs. And so we'll actually help them buy new equipment that brings uh, innovation or increases capacity. We've given over a million and a half dollars worth of grants in two years uh, and uh, to 14 facilities and have really begun to not bring it back to what it was in its heyday, but really make it cutting edge, really bring things that uh, aren't available in New York and bringing access to that. And also creating um, the uh, a hub so that the small designers can access that and find out about that. A lot of the time when you're starting out, and I know this is the challenge in Nashville as well, you have an idea, but you don't know where to go and have that made. And I, I think back to uh, uh, something Marcus from uh, Rag and Bone mentioned to me when he started their business. They weren't trained designers. They just came to the middle of New York, the garment district, and they just walked around until they looked up and they saw a sign in a window that was a factory, and they went up there and they said to the guy, we want to make something, uh, but we don't know how to make it. And the guy said, okay, I'll help you figure that out. And now they're a $350 million business. If they didn't have that guy in that second floor factory, and if they hadn't just stumbled on that, who knows where they might be? So we've taken that knowledge and we've centralized that now uh, digitally. and. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing that someone who's starting can now find that and, and make that kind of connection. Absolutely. So that's the fashion manufacturing initiative that you're talking about there. Something that, if I understand it correctly, something I think that is really cool about the FMI and the grants it gives is creative problem solving, right? Is, are they, the manufacturers who are coming to you, you know, applying for the grants, are they essentially answering calls that the designers have made in terms of needs? Yeah. I mean, I think in, in many ways they are. Some of, our, some of it is just capacity. They, 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 they don't have the ability to grow without right. an investment. So by coming to FMI, we give them greater capacity so they can take on more customers. But you can, I think embroidery is a good example. Like one of our uh, recipients, uh, we help buy a new embroidery machine and when you watch how embroidery is done on their old machine versus the new machine, it's night and day. So mm -hmm. that, uh, that is better quality and it's faster output. Gotcha, gotcha. So it's a $15 million initiative right now, right? Right. So what, can you talk a little bit about how public-private funding works? 
in the FMI? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to get uh, money from the government, and uh, <laughs> we've uh, never really uh, gotten much money from the government. Uh, and interestingly, when you look at other fashion capitals beyond New York, like London, there's a lot of uh, support uh, from government there. You know, uh, I, I think that the, 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 the key to those kind of relationships is, is, is relationships and resources. So the mayor's office is going to have some money uh, available, which we're going to have to earn by raising money and showing that we're invested uh, into the idea or to the initiative. But it's really the access to the people that uh, and the access that they have and being able to use that in a way that's very powerful. And so the, 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 the city of New York has done a really good job in bringing in all components of the industry from the design, the creative industries, but also the retail, the schools, um, manufacturing. So when you bring everybody together, there's a, a, a combined investment in success. Gotcha. So ultimately, the NFA would love to see something like this happen in Nashville, like we were saying. So what what challenges should we look out for as we start to build this? Like, what what is what what's come up as roadblocks along the way as you've built the FMI? That what can we learn from you? Well, I, I mean, in general, I think the challenges or the opportunities for uh, Nashville are really being Nashville and not being New York or not being LA, but tapping into what is. is, is is exciting about this city and what this city has to offer. You know, I, I'm a firm believer that in anything you get involved in uh, that you help grow, there's a certain level that uh, m might be my skill set. I might be able to get it to here, but my ability to get to here it might not be what I know how to do, and somebody else needs to take it there. So I think if you look at Nashville as a, as a, as a city that attracts young talent, that supports young talent and that incubates that to, and constantly feeding that with new businesses, new designers, but maybe someday they won't be here. You know, Maybe someday right. they will go to New York or Los Angeles and they've outgrown that. That's a good thing. You know, mm -hmm. You've contributed because then the next company that uh, uh, will come in and, and, and replace that. Um, I think it's about um, 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 you know, really connecting the, the idea, letting the creative be creative, mm -hmm. um, and letting that kind of be pure in its process, and, and helping that translate into something. Gotcha. So I've got a question about FMI going broader. Are there any plans for it to go to different regions? Like yeah, we, we, we're, we, um, we're about to announce uh, two very cool programs, which I can't announced, but one of them is a partnership with a major retailer uh, based in New York and seven designers who are doing a special CF Day made in New York capsule collection that will be sold nationally. So uh, the great thing about that program, it's creating work for local factories, uh, employing people in those factories, and then marketing made in New York. But we're going to be announcing uh, a, a second retail program with a national retailer with a made in New York and a made in LA component. Oh, so, cool. um, you know, ideally, I would love to see that program grow to instead of two times a year, four years, you could have made in New York, made in LA, made in Nashville, made in Florence, Alabama. Uh, so, uh, so there is a bit of that, and also we've been working. Uh, I think the challenge with local manufacturing uh, is our duties and tariffs that designers pay on fabric. So most designers who are part of the CFDA are importing wovens from Italy, and they can pay anywhere up to 30%. So that's very prohibitive to them in um, local manufacturing. It's cheaper and easier to do it overseas. So we've been working uh, in Washington and also in the city to see how uh, those tariffs, and, and they're very dated, those tariffs. They, uh, they're, they're, you can't get what that fabric is here in the States anyway anymore. So. Right but they remain uh, legislation. So working in Washington in the city to see how they can be eliminated or reduced, because that would be a huge stimulus for people wanting to make, not just in New York, but anywhere but in, in right. the country.
Terrific. Okay, well, that's the answer we wanted to hear here. So thank you so much. Thank I appreciate you. your time. All right. I'm thank you, Stephen. Let's give him a hand.